welcome to In Route, the podcast of the First Responder Behavioral Health Institute. The First Responder Behavioral Health Institute is bringing together some of the most inspiring and dedicated change agents in the global public safety, psychotherapy, and educational communities. Each episode of In Route seeks to bring together first responder change agents and clinicians dedicated to constructively disrupting the status quo by tackling the tough subjects like first responder suicide, post-traumatic stress, moral injury, sanctuary trauma, leadership development, critical incident response, peer support teams, and what it means to be psychologically safe and healthy while working in an unsafe world. All units, please stand by. The In Route podcast is about to begin. You can resume normal traffic on this channel after this transmission. I'm Joseph Brigandi. Welcome to this episode of In Route. Today, we have best selling author Michael Sagru, the author of Relentless Courage Winning the Battle Against Frontline Trauma. Michael is a medically retired police officer and an Air Force veteran who has served all over the world and returned home to serve his community as a police officer and a detective. Suffering a critical incident on the job placed him in the unenviable position of seeking solutions to his trauma and ultimately documenting his road to recovery in his book, Relentless Courage. Michael's mission is to help first responders overcome traumatic-related incidents and normalize mental health within the first responder community. One of the ways he does this is by public speaking, seminars, workshops, and by serving in a peer support role with the West Coast Trauma Retreats and as an ambassador for Save a Warrior. It is my pleasure to welcome retired Sergeant Michael Sagru. Hey, how's it going? Uh, it's going well. I'm so glad that you're here, and I wanted to let you know how much we love your book, uh, Relentless Courage. As you can see, we've uh, um, I spent a little bit of time going over it, um, and it just has so many messages of encouragement and um, um, courage uh, straight up. So tell us a little bit about yourself and why it is you do what you do, sir. It's a really long story. Um, I'm going to take you all the way back to childhood, which is where I knew for me this was a calling, that I wanted to go into a world of service both in the military and eventually as a police officer. Uh, my stepfather, who I considered my hero, my everything, he came into my life very early on. And I looked up to him, I mean, physically, you know, figuratively, in, in all ways imaginable. And he's really the reason why I pursued this career. And it literally started at eight years old as a police volunteer for her, his first police department. And through high school, I was a police explorer. And, you know, my original plan, it changed, but it was to go into federal law enforcement. And I knew if I was going to do that, I needed a college degree. And I also needed work experience beyond just that. So I decided to look into the military and the Air Force gave me a full scholarship. I went to California State University in Sacramento and I graduated in 98 with a BS in criminal justice. And I got my first choice of career fields, which was security forces. And that's basically military police, anti-terrorism force protection, nuclear security, you name it. And I literally served all over the world from South America, Europe, the Middle East, all over the United States. Um, while in, I actually got exposed to a lot of different federal agencies. And I quickly realized that it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. And I decided that I wanted to get out of the Air Force, which I did in 2004. I got out as a captain and I went straight into civilian law enforcement back here in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is where I'm from. And I got hired by the Walnut Creek Police Department in 2004. And I ended up serving um, over 14 years in different assignments from a patrol officer, field training officer, detective. I was undercover on a California State Department of Justice Narcotics Task Force, eventually promoted to sergeant. And actually, my real story now starts my second solo week as a patrol sergeant, I was involved in a very traumatic incident and that incident forever changed my path. It changed my personal life, my professional life. 
And it's, it's what led me here today on this work of literally smashing the stigma of asking for help and talking about mental health because, because of the stigma, I suffered in silence for over four years to the point where I didn't want to be here anymore. I literally wanted to die in the line of duty. And I started purposely putting myself in dangerous situations, hoping I got killed on the job. And it wasn't until another very tragic incident that pulled me out of this darkness and finally got me the strength and courage to ask for help. And now I'm on the other side of that journey, that recovery from post-traumatic stress injury. And I'm here to show people that, you know, number one, you're not alone, but number two, that there is help and there is hope. There's a whole new life on the other side of this. Well, I want to thank you for sharing that and also um, speaking so kindly of your stepdad. They get such bad raps in our society, but the truth of it is, you know, it's an 80-20 thing. 80% of the people who step up uh, to help with someone else's child have just got a great heart and a giving soul or they wouldn't have done that in the first place. So uh, to hear you honor him in that fashion is exceptional uh, and special. Um, so your journey led you many places that led you into uh, risks that led you into your own trauma. Um, what made you write relentless courage? What's the story behind uh, putting that book together? Why'd you do it? It's actually a good story. It's, it's kind of long, so I'll try to keep it as brief as I can. So Take um, your time. I medically retired. Thank you. I medically retired in 2018. I'm in August. And at that point, honestly, I was still ashamed and embarrassed about what I had gone through and what I had been doing. And I wasn't really in a position to where I ever thought I'd be openly talking about this stuff or sharing it. And fast forward about a year after I retired, a man I didn't know personally, his name was Danny Bird. He was actually a podcast host and I'd never done a podcast interview or any type of interview for that matter. And he hit me up on LinkedIn and said, look, you know, you're in a fitness, I'm in a fitness, I run this podcast called Iron Crew Athletics, and I'd love to have you on the show to talk about, you know, mental health and what it is that you're doing and your journey. And I was, I just told him, say, hey, you know, I appreciate the offer, but I'm really not interested. It's not my thing. And thankfully, this guy, you know, he pretty much harassed me and he kept hitting me up and asking me. And he got me to the point where he's like, look, he's like, I will drive the two and a half hours to you. I just need an hour of your time and that's it. And, and I'll make this happen. And so finally I agreed to do it and he ended up driving the two and a half hours and we met at this cafe and I go in the back. I'll never forget. I thought we we're going to sit down, have coffee, have breakfast, get to know each other. And he's like, Hey, I'm really sorry to do this to you, but I've got to be out of here in an hour. So we're just going to start this like right away. And so I put these headphones on. He had a video camera set up and it's funny in the interview today, you can hear the, background music of these Mimi's cafe that's kind of faintly playing in the background. And um, he just, he started asking me questions. And the thing is, I didn't think about the answers. I didn't think about, you know, let me answer this correctly, or let me sugarcoat this, or what's going to sound best. I just answered from the heart. I answered truthfully, very straightforward. And we had a great conversation. And the real magic and healing of this journey that I'm now on, this is where it happened. Because once he shared this episode, um, there's a couple things that happened, but the first thing was that this, this burden, these things I was just carrying on my shoulders, I finally was able to just let go and it was out there for the world to see and hear. And it, you know, if they liked it, they liked it. If they didn't, I couldn't control it anymore because I was trying to keep this information from everyone that I knew from my coworkers. I really didn't want them to know this stuff. And so when it got aired, I was kind of apprehensive thinking, you know, am I going to get messages from people that I know who look down upon me, you know, that it, it's shameful, it's embarrassing. And no, none of that happened. I started getting messages from all over the world, from Canada, from the UK, from Australia, from all over the United States, from people who said that my story was their story and how things that I went through and I talked about really resonated with them to the core. And so they started reaching out and sharing their personal stories with me. And that's where I realized that, you know, there is so much healing and sharing, not just for myself, but for others. And it's really mutual, you know, beneficial for both of us. And so that led to just podcast after podcast after podcast all over the world. And eventually that led to public speaking. And I started out small. I just did a couple of local agencies here in Northern California. 
And eventually I did some statewide conferences. And the next thing you know, I'm speaking all over the United States. Now, to get to the story about the book, um, right before COVID happened, my co-author, Dr. Shauna Springer, amazing, amazing woman. She's a clinical psychologist who has worked with combat veterans, first responders. She worked with the Veterans Affairs with Tragedy Assistance Program for Survivors. And so she truly understands first responders and military members. And so she reached out to me again on LinkedIn and said, hey, I would just like to talk to you and see what you're doing. I want to explain what I'm doing and and see if we can collaborate or help each other out. And so she calls up and she starts talking about the stellate ganglion block, which I've since had, but at the time I was a little skeptical. And after that conversation, she asked me, well, what's your story? You know, tell me about you. And so I told her my very deep, dark personal story all the way back from childhood into present day. And after she heard it, she said, you know, have you ever thought about writing a book about this? And I said, I kind of chuckled because I said, I've, I've kind of thought about it. But to be honest with you, you know, because of post-traumatic stress injury, I don't have the same focus, the same uh, attention to detail, the drive, the motivation that I used to have. I just, I don't think I can make a project like that happen. And so we let the conversation at that. A few weeks later, she hits me back up again. And she says, look, she's like, your story, it's just, it's really just sitting with me. I, I can't stop thinking about it. And she said, I've heard hundreds and hundreds of trauma stories, but your story is going to help countless people. And, and I want to make this project happen. I want to do this project with you. And in that moment, I had never met her in person. We've only talked on the phone, but I knew in my heart this was right. And so we agreed to do it. And then COVID happens. We literally didn't meet like in person until over a year into this project. We were doing weekly Zoom meetings, two hours at a time. And we started this project. You know, we laid out the format, the structure, what we're going to talk about. And this book is, it's groundbreaking. I don't know of anything else out there like it. And and the best part about it is this is living proof of the collaboration of what's possible between a culturally competent clinician or therapist and a first responder or a military member. I mean, it's, it's living proof that together we can accomplish great things and that you can overcome the darkest valleys and you can come out the other side of this journey. And so every chapter has two parts. The first part is my story told in my voice, but the second part, Dr. Springer comes in, she breaks everything down in very simple terms, very easy to understand. And she does it in a way that everybody and anybody who reads this book, I mean, I don't care if you're a 12 year old child or if you're a first responder, an active military member, a family member of one, or even just a person on the street who doesn't even know a military member or first responder, you are now going to see the real human side behind the badge and behind the uniform. And this book is saving, it's saving relationships, it's saving careers, but most importantly, it's saving lives all over the world. I agree with that. And, um, you know, I want you to know I've had more than one um, client bring your book into session. I'm a psychotherapist. Most people don't realize I've been a first responder for 35 years myself, firefighter and a paramedic. Um, And I went back and got board certified. One of the reasons was, as you stated, there wasn't enough culturally competent people. Um, And then finally, after hearing story and story about uh, our members receiving poor services, I said to myself, laughingly, I, I couldn't possibly do a worse job. <laughs> and then I went ahead and I decided uh, to try this, and I realized how hard it is uh, to become a culturally competent clinician. Fast forward a dozen years, and um, you know, I uh, uh, founded the Counseling Center of Texas, and I'm uh, board certified and a specialist in uh, post-traumatic stress and traumatic-related disassociation. I still work in the field today and run crisis response teams and work with our members. And I'm forever hearing them talk about how challenging it can be to get good uh, clinicians and great help. But the the, um, good part of that message is uh, folks like Dr. Springer, um, and I'm hearing more stories like you, more people are going back and getting their graduate degrees that have been first responders and that really do understand our community. 
Um, so it's nice to see that. Uh, one of the things you talked about is um, often talked about um, after critical incidents, um, was it valor or was it an attempt at suicide? I've had more than one member on my fire department teams who was taking excessive risks, and I never want to discount valor. It is, um, as I tell my um, uh, students, I teach the paramedic program. It's an interesting word, but it's something you never want to see in real life. Um, someone has taken an extreme risk, and, um, you know, hopefully they're here to tell that story. Um, but unfortunately, sometimes we're taking too many risks. Um, and you're very honest about that, um, that that is sometimes in the mind of a first responder who's suffer- suffering too much. Um, and doesn't really care if they go home anymore. Um, and the integrity it took for you to put that in print, um, you know, you won my heart, and I have so many clients now who are, are speaking your name and a couple that are bringing your book into the treatment suite. And I never uh, cross lines. I don't tell them I'm interviewing you in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> um, they'll find that if they check uh, the web and, and see the opportunity that we've had to visit today. Um, but um, as you said with your work, it's an easy read. It's a deep read. And in some instances, it's a hard read because uh, you go ahead and uh, it'll, it'll uh, hijack your immune system and take you right on that journey, which is, which is brilliant writing. Um, and I want to go ahead and uh, uh, compliment you and commend you for that. Um, you brought up something else that uh, scares people. Uh, you went ahead and tried the um, uh, Stella Ganglion block Tell us a little bit more about that. I mean, I even know clinicians that are afraid of that or intimidated. What was your experience uh, undergoing that procedure? Um, you know, the, the procedure itself was, it was painless. It was quick. I mean, it was, it was, it was like nothing, honestly. So, um, you know, to go back though, when she first told me about this, I had never heard of Stella Ganglion Block. And I really kind of just discounted it right away on the surface because I thought this is just too good to be true. And I kind of just put it on the back burner. But when we decided to do this project, I started reaching out to people who I knew had had the procedure done. And I, and I had some real in-depth personal conversations with them. And I wanted to find out, you know, what was their personal experience? And so once I did that and I started doing other research online, I mean, I, there was literally even a 60 Minutes episode that came out several years ago that talked about this. And so there is a lot of information out there, even though most people haven't heard of it. And so I finally committed to it. I decided to do it. And a phenomenal organization called Mission 22, which is actually dedicated to combat veterans and first responders and helping them heal through post-traumatic stress, actually funded my procedure. And Doc Springer actually went down with me personally to get this procedure done to kind of put me at ease. And so I went down to San Jose, which is about hour and a half, two hours south of me, and very professional office, met with the anesthesiologist because this procedure, it's only done by a medical doctor. And in this case, it was done by an anesthesiologist, you know, a phenomenal doctor who's been practicing for many years, who is specially trained in this procedure. And what I didn't know, I know now today is that SGB has been around for over 100 years. It was actually used to treat for pain. And so, you know, the procedure isn't new, but as far as being used for post-traumatic stress, I think that's been done now for about probably like 20 years or so. I don't know the exact length, but at least 20 years that special operators in the military community and other areas have been getting this procedure done. And so we went down to San Jose. I remember meeting with the doctor and the prep took longer than the actual procedure itself. And they gave me a choice. They said, you know, you can do twilight sedation or no sedation at all. And I ended up doing the procedure twice, once on the right side and once on the left side. And I did it both ways. I did it with the sedation and without the sedation. And I was awake for the entire procedure. I remember it. Um, The doctor explained everything. It's basically, it's done under imaging. So a sonogram or some kind of imaging device. And the doctor puts a anesthetic, a common anesthetic, which is commonly used in childbirth and delivery and they shoot it in a bundle of nerves, usually on the right side first. And the whole concept or idea of this procedure is that that anesthetic goes into that bundle of nerves, which controls the amygdala. And that's the primitive side of the human brain. We all have it. And that's what controls the physical like fight or flight symptoms that we get. 
Um, again, it's not controlling the um, psychological symptoms, but it's controlling the physical symptoms. And that's what this procedure is designed to do is to help deal with or manage those physical symptoms. So then you can, after that, use conventional forms of treatment like therapy or go to retreats, um, you know, other things like that. So in this case, I had the procedure done. I followed up with group meetings and, and other things, and it was phenomenal. I remember the first day we got it done, um, right after the procedure, we actually went out to lunch. And I remember halfway through lunch, Doc Springer says, hey, do you even realize that you're back is turned to the entire restaurant and to the front door and you have all these people directly behind you. And I, I actually, I stopped for a second and I looked and I couldn't believe it because I always sit where I can see the front door. I always sit with my back to the wall and it just didn't occur to me. I mean, it literally put me at ease and, you know, fast forward a week or two after that, um, I kind of hit up a couple of my friends that I work out with at the gym. And I said, look, I just want you to keep an eye on me. Let me know if you notice anything, um, anything different or unusual. And, and they said, okay. And what they noticed was that my focus and concentration at the gym was a lot better. Um, I noticed that I wasn't getting road rage like I used to when I was driving because I used to get really bad road rage. And and I, I would just go from zero to 60. I mean, literally, I just it was not good. And, and with this procedure, I was driving slower. I wasn't worried about people passing me up or driving next to me. And, and it was nice. I mean, I, I slept better. And so for me, it, it was effective. And, um, you know, I, I strongly recommend people looking into the procedure and, and, you know, doing the research, make sure you have a, a trained doctor, only a doctor who is trained in this specific procedure. But I had zero side effects other than um, I had a droopy eye for a few hours, which is normal. And that was it. No other side effects, no pain, no nothing, no follow-up. And again, this is a medical procedure. So when you go in for this procedure, they're not talking to you about your trauma. They're not there to do therapy with you. You don't have to relive all your horrible experiences. You're in there for like 15 minutes to get this medical procedure done to treat the physical symptoms. Nice. You know, you reminded me a little bit of my own uh, journey. Um, um, one of the treatments that I used for my own post-traumatic stress was EMDR. I'm now trained in it at high levels. And it is as well highly effective, but sometimes it, it's not going to go ahead and alleviate these symptoms. And this is where the block can go ahead and come in. Um, my wife was at one point and I was in a restaurant and she said to me, I am so proud of you. And I said, why? And she said, because you're sitting with your back to everybody. And then I had to put my head down for a moment. I said, honey, there's a full length mirror behind you. I can see everything. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> um, but know, these, yeah. I, I do have to tell you on your, your point on EMDR. So I have a quick story about that because um, the program I now volunteer for the West Coast Post Trauma Retreat, I went through as a client back in 2017. I'd never heard of EMDR. And that's one of the things that they do is they actually have clinicians who come in and they do EMDR on everybody. And for me personally, EMDR did not work, but I saw it personally work on many people. And every time that I go back, I see it work time and time again. But I think what's important for people to understand that there's not any procedure or technique out there that's 100% effective for everybody. And in most cases, you have to try a combination of different things to get the results that you want. And so I just, you know, I want, I know you get it, but I want the listeners to understand that you have to be patient and you have to realize that, you know, something that works for you may not work for somebody else or vice versa. And, and you really have to be patient with this journey and be willing to try new things and step out of your comfort zone. I'm really glad you said that. And, and thank you so much for um, articulating that point. When people come to see me, I promise to stay with them through the entire process, uh, not to go ahead and there's no one size fits all solution. We're going to start with talk therapy, go into cognitive behavioral. We're going to try EMDR on target zones. Then we're going to refer out uh, for things like the block and we'll go ahead and look at medication. Um, the, the best part of this, though, is most people don't need medication after uh, EMDR after uh, things like the stellate ganglion block, um, and they're able to go ahead and handle life uh, and return to service in some instances. 
um, if they want to. Uh, but that is a, the, its own question as to, you know, what does the next aspect of this journey take? One of the things that you covered in your book, um, and I'd like you to uh, give some words to that, is the alarming rate of suicide within the first responder community. Uh, tell us a little bit more about that. It's, it's a sad reality um, that the fact is, and not just for law enforcement, but all first responders, so firefighters, paramedics, dispatchers, and even our military members, the number one threat is ourselves. We are more likely to die by our own hands than the hands of another. That is an absolute fact. And even though you know we've gotten better at tracking these numbers year over year, and there's a group called First Help, it used to be called Blue Help, they started tracking just the law enforcement numbers, and now they also track firefighters, paramedics, dispatchers. But they started tracking these numbers back in 2016. And just for law enforcement, I know today that we are well over 1,200 reported suicides since then. And, and I would estimate that those numbers are probably at least three to four times underestimated. And year over year, the suicides far outnumber the line of duty deaths. And the only exception was during COVID, those numbers um, were higher in some cases. But if you take away COVID as causes of death, then suicide remains the number one killer for all first responders. And it's, it's that ugly elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about, nobody wants to acknowledge. And you, you kind of alluded to this earlier about you know the valor thing, but I also point something else out to you is that how many times have we heard of a tragic vehicle collision where an officer, you know, not wearing their seatbelt, crashes into a sound wall or crashes into a tree? Now, I'm not saying it is or isn't, but... In some cases, those are suicides. And in some cases, they're just horrible accidents that happened on duty. You know, and the facts are that even as much as we do know, I will tell you there is much more that we don't know. And the threat doesn't stop when we retire. It actually goes up. I know that a lot of suicides happen within five years after retiring from being a first responder. Because when we're working and we're operational, we do well. You know, we don't stop and think about all these horrific things that we've had to see and deal with over our 20, 30 year career. But once we're not on the job, once we're not operational, or even if we're out on a physical injury, that's when these things start come flooding back. These things that we never talked about, we never dealt with. And the interesting thing that I've learned through this process too, and I, and I experienced this personally, is that a lot of the suicide, in my opinion, is not a result of the horrific scenes that we go to and tragic incidents, it actually deals with administrative betrayal or institutional betrayal. When our quote unquote families, our blue family or our red family, when they abandon us, when we need them most, yeah. or when they turn their back on us, that's usually what pushes us over the edge. And in my case, that was very true. And that's Ironically enough is what that part of it has been resonating with most people with this new book is the admin institutional betrayal part. And, and that's really what we need to address. Oh, I'm so glad you mentioned that. And you're right. It's a very poorly understood thing. And it's one of the things that went into the founding of the Institute. Um, I brought the Institute together uh, so that I could bring some of the world's best educators on first responder topics together to truly handle three things. The psychology of the self. We don't teach police officers in the academy how to be psychologically healthy. Um, and we don't teach firefighters and paramedics this either. Um, nowhere in the paramedic manual, and I've taught that program many a time, is there anything on how to be a healthy paramedic. Um, psychology of how we deal with the public. Well, um, the paramedic manual has about 15 pages in it to deal with psychology. Most of the information contained in those pages has something to do with physical or chemical restraint of the patient. Nothing about de-escalation, nothing about understanding signs and symptoms of psychosis or depression or a bipolar disorder. No education at all. And then the third one, and the one that really gets them in my office, is uh, also another psychological fact and truism. Um, it is uh, covered under the psychological discipline of organizational development or industrial psychology as it used to be uh, labeled when we were back in college. But truly, this has to do with 
uh, toxic leadership, and the entire term sanctuary trauma uh, was uh, developed by the Canadians, and it's come out in a couple of manuals there. And as you already know and can explain very well, sanctuary trauma is what happens when you go to your own people. You ask for help, and they go ahead and target you for removal, uh, start taking your gun away, put you on a desk, move you to an undesirable shift. In the fire service, uh, <clears throat> they won't let you uh, return back after you've completed a course of therapy or treatment. Um, I've had many of um, firefighter who's gone to the IAFF Center for Excellence. It's a wonderful recovery program. And it's intensive and also been with me two days a week in treatment. And I'm writing glowing letters that this firefighter paramedic is ready to return to service. The Center for Excellence does the same thing. And the major metropolitan city terminates their employment anyway. They simply don't understand that, um, you know, many post-traumatic injuries are just that. It's not a full-on disorder most of the time. Most of the time we can get to it, we can treat it. And there is a road to recovery ahead and a return to service. And that is um, not understood. That's a big issue. Uh, and one of the other things is you fall off a ladder, you break your leg. We have physical therapy, occupational therapy. Uh, the individual has a mental health injury and we are scared to death. And most often that's when the abandonment happens. That's the sanctuary trauma. That's the moral injury. Uh, and our people suffer from that the most. When I'm worried about a first responder becoming suicidal on me and the treatment suite as a clinician, it's not the call. That call brought them to me. This is true. But it's um, how is their home life? How are things suffering or not suffering there? Then there's that critical incident of that, that call. And then it's how is the administration handling it? That is one of the most important parts. Uh, toxic leadership uh, poor decision-making from an administrative perspective actually does cost police and firefighters and members of our military their lives. And um, it's not a truth that's spoken, and it's time that we uh, get out there and articulate it uh, delicately. I'm not here uh, to start a revolution. I'm here to cause evolution. And one of the things that made me really enjoy you every time I see you on the Internet is it smashed the stigma. And you're out there trying to go ahead and give voice to this uh, so that our members can be better represented. Um, so um, to, a, to a first responder who's suffering under the weight of a poor administration um, or having troubles, what message do you have for them? First off, you're, you're not alone. You know, for so long, I thought I was alone. I thought there was something wrong with me. I thought that there was no one who would understand how I'm feeling understand the things that I'm going through and through my recovery process, especially going to first responder meetings where I met my fellow brothers and sisters who were openly sharing their stories and their deep, dark, personal experiences with me. I quickly realized that I'm not alone. And I also realized that everything I was feeling that everything I was going through was actually normal. It was a normal reaction to the horrific and abnormal things that we had to see and we had to deal with. And I never addressed those. I never talked about those things. But I want you to know that there is hope and there is help. And it's it's not going to be easy. It's going to be a journey. And, and what I learned is that I waited four years, four years to get help. And that was far too long. And if you get help sooner than later, then you're much more likely to be able to return to your work, you know, to your life of service that you so want to do. But if you wait too long like I did, then it might be too late to keep doing that job. You know, I had to medically retire. I could no longer do this job, but I firmly believe that if we smash the stigma and we normalize these discussions, because this is normal, if we can do that, then you can get through a full career healthy and come out healthy the other side and enjoy your retirement. And that's what this is all about is remember, it's a job. Don't forget about your family. Don't forget about your health. And know that you are not alone. I assure you there is endless resources out there and endless people who truly understand it and truly get it. Absolutely. You touched on the uh, fact that our uh, recent retirees are at risk. Um, this is a statistical that's no, a statistic that is known, um, and we're just starting to have it addressed. Um, in many instances, the Australians are light years ahead of us. Uh, when it comes to this, uh, for their police and fire services, they have a program called five to zero. 
So in the last five years of your service, year five, what are you planning to do in retirement? Year four, what do your finances look like? Year three, what other kinds of things are you engaging for the future? Year two, what does that future look like? Year one, how can we help you towards that separation so that you don't walk into the station one day, sign off on the radio, everybody pats you on the back, and then you're a civilian. And then you're staring at the walls at home wondering, what do I do now? You know, so five to zero is a brilliant program. We're trying to get an instructor uh, that does that program to come into the First Responder Behavioral Health Institute to try to broaden it uh, for the American audience and the North American audience uh, so that we can go ahead and address that as well. Um, But it is not addressed. It is not understood. Um, And uh, another thing you talk about in your book, and we want to talk a little bit about um, recognizing that things are starting to go awry. You talk about the gallows humor, and I certainly have a a dark humor cell somewhere (laughs) in the back of my body. Um, But uh, it's it's seen as a coping mechanism. Sometimes it can be a little bit more. Tell us about the gallows humor. Um, you know, I learned this first off. I mean, my very first week or two of FTO where I had graduated the academy, I was a police trainee. And while you're in the FTO process, you know, you usually go to the worst calls because you've got to get experience and they send you to just everything they can. So when you're finally cut loose on your own, you know how to handle these types of calls for service. And so a couple of these incidents, which I talk about in detail in my book, were just horrific. And um, one of them, I, I literally like, felt sick to my stomach and literally almost vomited. And to this day, um, you know, involved the body being burned. It was a homicide. And to this day, like if I'm cooking or I'm near a stove and like I smell like burnt hair smell, it brings me right back to that, to that moment back in 2004 into that autopsy room where I was seeing a body being cut open and charred chunks of flesh falling off. And I remember after we left that coroner's office and I was in the patrol car with my FTO, Um, We started debriefing the incident, you know, talking about the um, logistics of it, the facts, the the laws, how we're going to document this evidence. And we joked about it. And and that's where I learned it. That's where I learned that, you know, we don't acknowledge the real humanity, the, the, the just horrible things that we see. We just we use it as defense mechanism and we make fun of it and we laugh. And that's how we tell other people that this doesn't bother us. And so we do that call after call after call you know, year after year after year. And at first that may work. I mean, it may work to be detached and to tell yourself that I'm not going to take this stuff internally. I'm not going to take it personally. This is a job. You know, I don't know these people. These are strangers, but the fact is we're human and eventually it's going to catch up to you. And eventually it is going to hit you to the core. And and so that's where we need to change this is that if, if we start that FTO process and when we're debriefing the call, like if I was the FTO, like I once was, if I use that time to say, look, you know what, um, I just I, I want to talk about how horrible this was, you know, just being in that room and and seeing that poor lady and then finding out what happened to her. I mean, you know, that this really jacked up my sleep last night and I just can't get that image out of my head right now. You know, I'm just talking about it. I'm just getting off my chest. I'm having a conversation. But as the senior officer, as the trainer, as the leader, if I lead by that example, by being vulnerable, by being real and just acknowledging this. Oh my God. I mean, that, that's the solution to this. Like we wouldn't have to have all this, you know, treatment programs and therapy because we'd be doing our own therapy every single day with each other, just talking about it. But because of this machismo, this culture that we have, that we're badasses, that we're invincible, almost superheroes, nothing bothers us, nothing affects us. And that any kind of emotion or feelings is weakness. And we're not going to ever show that. And I get that on the scene. Like we have to be composed and, and, keep order. But when we're away from that scene, if these truly are our brothers and sisters, you know, we should be able to open up to them and and just freely talk about this stuff without being judged or looked down upon. And that's where we have to change things is, you know, let's get rid of the gallows humor and let's just acknowledge the humanity of this. So we want to go ahead and ask you a little bit about your own coping mechanisms, about resilience, and a little bit about what that looks like for you on the day to day. Yeah. For, so for me, having a routine is very important. I need structure. Um, it fills my days. It fills my times. And so typically I drop my daughter off at school in the morning and then I head straight to the gym. And usually I work out with one of my buddies. Uh, one is actually a veteran 
And the other one is somebody I went to the police academy with who is still in law enforcement. And so not only am I working out, but it's almost like a mini therapy session with my buddies where we can openly talk about anything and everything. And I'm not talking about just job stuff, but I'm talking about, you know, relationships, finances, health issues, like whatever's going on in our life. And so after that, usually we'll go out to lunch and then I'll come back home and I'll meditate, you know, jump in the shower. And then it's a matter of just getting things done throughout the day, you know, go and picking up my daughter. Um, and then at night I like to practice gratitude. And so right before I go to sleep, um, I write down three things or I think about three things that were positive that happened earlier in the day. And literally it can be as simple as like, I woke up today with no pain or, you know, I made it to the gym and worked out with my friend or I, I saw my mom for lunch, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, but I think that we can all find at least a few positive things in our day. And so by practicing gratitude, I think about these things right before I go to sleep. And that leaves me with positive thoughts instead of negative thoughts. And hopefully in the morning, you know, I wake up feeling refreshed, feeling positive, and then I carry on throughout the day. But it also makes me aware, you know, when I look back at my day and say, well, what did I do today? You know, what happened? Oh, wow. Yeah, that was that was great. You know, I forgot about that or I forgot about this uh, because I was one of those guys that was always focusing on the negative. You know, I want to say pessimistic, but it was always, you know, everything was bad. Everything was negative. And, and that's not the case. You know, truly, I have a lot to be grateful for. And so I think gratitude is is really, really important. Nice. Thank you for sharing that with us. We all need a routine. And that's one of the first things that starts to fall away as we start to go into crisis. Uh, I could have gone with a, for a run uh, with the guys, but I chose to sleep in. Oh, I'm too tired to go ahead and do this or that. And so there's that's starting to creep in. And we're not even noticing it because it slips in a little bit every day. Um, with all of the agencies now you get to uh, fly around and speak to, um, talk to me a little bit about peer support programs. I'm surprised to learn many agencies still don't have them. And then here I am um, recommending clinically directed peer support programs so that there's at least uh, one or two clinicians in that team that are trusted by the peer support group uh, so that they have some professional help. But with a clinician directed or without a clinic, clinician directed program, you, what are your thoughts on peer support and its role in, in helping out here? I think peer support is critical, but um, also, you know, to go back to my incident. So I was involved in a fatal shooting back in 2012. And at that time, my agency was very progressive. We had a full peer support program. We had a contracted therapist that worked with us. Um, everybody got laminated cards back then with a list of names and phone numbers of people that you could call or text 24 seven. Um, we had training every year where we talked about mental health and whatnot. But for me personally, I didn't really believe in it at the time. And I didn't have these relationships, these trusted relationships already formed before my shooting. But I think had we had people that I want to say have been there and done that, you know, officers or first responders who have been on the job for a while, who have experienced things both personally, you know, at home, but also professionally on the job. Um, because I think that's really important to have people that you can relate to. But you also need to know that you can trust these people, that it's private, that it's confidential, that it's protected, that it's not going to be used against you. And I remember thinking back at our program, you know, not to knock the people that were on peer support then, but they were all kind of like the popular, likable people. You know, they didn't really rock the boat. They were friendly. But a lot of them have never really done the job. I mean, they, they haven't been there in these really high risk situations or scenarios. And I honestly didn't feel comfortable with any of them, nor would I've ever called them or reached out to them. And so I think what's critical in a peer support program is that a, it's being used because you could have the best program on paper. You could be checking all the boxes, but nobody in the program completely worthless. Based of tests, peer support, program is that actively used and that people are getting help they're getting support confidential protector when they need and in my case i didn't have that so you know enough it wasn't 12 fast forward 23 and like you said i speak all over the nation and i'm blown away sometimes i mean i don't want to dime out certain states or counties or cities right now but 
I've seen some, some huge differences in what's going on out there. There's no standardization. Um, some agencies, especially rural agencies or agencies in, in real small cities, they don't have any of these resources. You know, they don't have these programs. And even if you have small agencies, um, what I think's been really effective is having like regional peer support teams. But again, you have to get to know these people. You know, you can't just bring in a regional peer support program where they've never seen these people, they've never done training with them, they've never gotten a chance to know them and expect them to just, you know, feel like they can trust them and open up about these things that are bothering them. So again, I think peer support is critical. It's absolutely critical. Um, and, and we talk about this book and Doc Springer talks about it, but conventional therapy or talk therapy with a clinician or a counselor and peer support, they complement each other. Yeah. You know, it's not one of the pieces that I really need to have both of them. Yeah. I could not agree more. And um, I uh, definitely want to go ahead and uh, underscore what you were saying about trust. A lot of times when I go on out to agencies, um, we have to establish that trust. Uh, they have to know that we're independent from the agency, that we do not report to internal affairs, we do not report to human resources, um, that I don't say a word to them, that I'm here for you. Um, I don't force, you're not my client, you didn't come through the front door um, and uh, fill out the paperwork. I'm not going to force you into the hospital. I'm an advisor and a guide. I'm here to go ahead and recommend solutions. You can tell me to go scratch and that's fine. Uh, but one of the biggest things that... Uh, um, that I've often met with too, when we establish those relationships is, you know, um, if the administration sent him in here, I can, you can't trust him guys. Um, and it's, it's wonderful to see those programs grow over the years, uh, as I have here in Texas to where, uh, now they're calling you first. They're asking you to come out, come into our home, come to our next session, do a training. We've got a couple of guys and uh, gals that need to meet you. Um, and, and the trust is there. Um, and they know uh, that, you know, we don't provide back-channeled information to the administration. Um, you know, and I, and I know maybe four great clinicians here um, in the DFW Metroplex that have uh, a wonderful agency uh, relationships with, with uh, police and fire departments. And uh, we were called competitors once, and I loved it. Uh, you know who your friends are when you know who, how they speak about you when you're not in the room. And uh, uh, one of my uh, so-called competitor colleagues, I uh, love her to this day. Uh, she runs a practice in uh, Fort Worth, uh, Tampa Sherrill, uh, with the Brave Fight. And uh, she uh, turned on that at commander and said, hey, Joseph and I are in competition. We're in competition against first responder suicide. I don't care if you call him. I don't care if you call me. But damn it, call one of us, please. Um, I refer to him regularly. He refers to us regularly. Her specialization is a little bit more in the veterans. My specialization is a little bit more in the first responders. So sometimes if there's a cultural jam up and they really insist on, you know, talking to someone who's been overseas and done a few tours, you know, I'll refer them to her agency. And if she's wanting somebody that's, uh, you know, struggling within her agency that has uh, um, expressed a desire to have someone who's got more of a, uh, civilian first responder background, uh, she'll send them over to the Counseling Center of Texas. And as a matter of fact, she teaches um, uh, and she's a member of the advisory board for the First Responder Behavioral Health Institute. There's no competition here. Uh, the competition is against suicidality um, and uh, competing against each other to see who can keep our first responders safer. Um, and uh, we support each other wholeheartedly. So, um, you know, those concepts have to go by the wayside. Trust has to be built. It is built over time, and it is built by being willing to get out there at 3 o'clock in the morning, as our crisis response teams do, um, and then showing up uh, on those calls um, and doing uh, diffusing and debriefing style work afterwards. Um, but you talked about trust. It is so important. Peer support programs are an essential part of this. Uh, clinically directed, well, we've got to get more clinicians that are trained in how to deal with this culture. And that's something the Institute also stands for in some of the courses uh, that we're trying to offer are two tracks, uh, behavioral health first responder, if you take a dozen classes with us, and then behavioral health clinical responder, if you're a clinician and you're wanting to learn how to add uh, value-added services uh, to uh, police, fire, EMS, and military agencies, uh, you've got to get uh, boots, you've got to go into the field 
um, and you've got to work with these cultures. Uh, it's the only way you're going to get their uh, respect, and it's the only way you're going to make a change and make a difference. Um, so I want to know what is next for Michael. Is there going to be another book? Um, at this time, no, there's no plans for that. But again, this book wasn't planned. I never thought it would happen. So who knows, I guess, is the answer to that particular question. Um, but to be honest with you, you know, I am fully retired and my daughter turns 13 next week. And my focus is her. My focus is enjoying life, living life to the fullest. So even though I do speak across the nation, I limit to only four or five times a year max. That is it. And so, um, you know, I, I do want to help as many people as I can. I enjoy speaking. I enjoy getting out there and meeting people. But it's also a balance. And what I've learned is that I don't manage stress like I used to. I can't multitask to the point where I was doing, you know, 15 different things at once or working, you know, four 15 hour shifts in a row with no sleep. Like those days are long gone. And I'm of the mindset now that I'm going to take a pause. I'm going to enjoy life, you know, live it to the fullest. I go to concerts, I go to sports games, I go hiking, go on vacation. Um, that is my priority. And so, uh, but there is one thing that I hope happens, a couple things. Um, I would like to speak internationally at some point. So I have spoken all across the United States, but my goal would be to get out to Australia, to the UK, to go to Canada. And the ultimate goal, if they're listening or watching this, um, two of my favorite movies are Training Day and End of Watch. And if uh, one of those directors or producers decides to turn this book into a movie, well, that would be that would be phenomenal because then how many more people would be hearing this message? How many more lives would be saved? And really, that is my focus, to save as many lives as I can. Absolutely. Um, so if somebody hasn't um, accessed your book, how do we go ahead and get a copy of that book? Um, so the book is only, well, actually, no, I guess it's it's available on Amazon, but it's also on Barnes & Noble. Um, it's available at walmart.com. Um, but the primary source is Amazon, and there's hardcover, paperback, Kindle, and we just released the Audible version actually six weeks ago today. And we recorded it in our own voices. So you actually hear our stories firsthand from both myself and Dr. Springer. And I can't tell you how powerful it is. I mean, it is so much more intimate and powerful than reading the actual book. Um, and so I would highly recommend just going directly to Amazon. All the different formats are there. It's very easy. And you can get it either instantly or in a day or two max. So nice. As we start to wrap up today, and I can't thank you enough for being so gracious to give us your time uh, to share uh, your journey uh, with our uh, subscribers, with our audience of growing first responders and agencies. Um, what last words would you have uh, for us uh, as we start to wrap up? You know, we all have a story. Um, I'm not special and I'm not unique. And the experiences that I've had, so many other people have had them as well. And so if you're out there struggling in silence, thinking you're the only one, again, you're not, I assure you're not, I promise you're not the only one who is going through what you're going through or feeling what you're feeling. But know that when the time is right for you to share your story, it's going to help you. It's going to heal you, but it's also going to help others. And I just encourage everyone out there to just share your story. Michael, thank you so much for sharing your story today on En Route. It was an honor, a uh, privilege, and a pleasure to have you on the show. So thank you. And for this episode, I'm Joseph Brigandi. Thank you for joining us for this episode of En Route. En Route is a production of the First Responder Behavioral Health Institute. To learn more about us, head on over to frbhi.com.